Hey everybody, my name's Daryl Robert. Welcome back to The Journey to VR. This week I had the opportunity to interview John Tojak. John's the artist that's doing the reality capture for the environment in my first VR experience, and he shared with me some really awesome tips and tricks. I hope you guys enjoy them. John, thanks for taking the time to hang out with us today, and reality capture, what it's all about. Let's, uh, let's start with the basics here. What are, you, what are you thinking about when someone comes to you and says, reality capture, I want to get something done? Like, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Well, the first issue is, are we capturing a small object or a human body, or do we want an environment? Okay. Um, you know, small objects like a shoe or a, a rock or a tree, those are the common ones. Those are easy. Okay. Humans are pretty tricky, but environments are pretty much the worst. There's just a lot of stuff. Awesome. So, of course, I need an environment. <laughs> of course you did. Yes. <laughs> no. Environments are best. So, you know, I know that um, when we were thinking about the environment, you had some advice for me. You know, we definitely f threw around a few ideas. We thought indoor, outdoor. Um, what, are, what are the, pro like, we thought about your apartment, which is behind you, the parking garage in your building, um, some exterior shots. What, what are you looking for in an environment that's going to, you know, give you success? Well, the cool thing of an environment, it's got to be a space, you know, so w once you're going outdoors, you can find a space like an alley that has, you know, two clear walls and maybe a third building. So you can have three walls. At least you need three walls and then the sky or, you know, that that works for an environment that's outside. I personally, I like outdoor environments. The thing is, you got to capture the sky. So along with your photogrammetry, you got to shoot a panoramic which would get all those things in the distance and the sun and the clouds and the current lighting setup. Okay. Then you have interiors. Interiors, you want something, you know, the best are like ruins or things that are deserted, very detailed and decayed with tons of things on the walls and the floor. The more tracking markers from natural decay you have, the better photogrammetry result you'll get. Some things you don't like are modern, clean apartments that have reflective surfaces are very poor um, photogrammetry on a car that's very reflective is difficult in my apartment did not work out that well because i have like blank walls okay. that are one color just a beige and if there's not a lot for the camera to pick up and track it does make it difficult to get a good photogrammetry solution Right. So we ultimately ended up on deciding to use a staircase inside of your building, which had concrete walls, lots of texture in there and pretty defined light sources. So it seems like our early tests, you know, are, are positive. It looks like the, the geometry is going to end up looking really sweet when it's done. So once you've kind of scouted your location, you know, you know what you want to do and what you're trying to accomplish. Next step is, is photographing the environment. So do you have any tips and like what type of gear are you using? What's the process of doing the photographic uh, work for the acquisition of the photos? And how many photos do you need? You know, like what are you, what are you thinking? It's always more photos is better. And the most important thing is sharpness of the photos. You want complete clarity, no blurring of any sort. Okay. So you do everything you can to make your camera shoot very sharp photos. The first thing and most obvious is stability. So you want a tripod. Right after that stability, you want a remote control. Okay. So you're never touching the camera. You don't want any camera motion. And um, some people do this handheld. Sometimes you don't have a choice if you're outside. If you have to do it handheld, you brace yourself and you use the timer, two second timer, so you can take a breath and hold the camera still. So those are all the physical things that help your camera get a good, clean photo. Okay. After that, there's all the settings of the camera and, of course, the physical camera. So I got a Sony Alpha 7. It's a reasonable full-frame sensor. And I got a good lens, a Zeiss lens. It's a variable lens between 24 and 70 millimeters. That's not the most ideal. Uh, the best would be a fixed lens. Like a you know, just a fixed 24 millimeter. Okay. But mine's variable but I locked it to 24 millimeters. The reason I want that, I want the widest angle possible so I can capture as much of the space as possible. So a fairly wide lens. Yeah. You could do a 35 millimeter fixed, that'd be fine. Then you have to do all your settings of the camera. You want a very low ISO to have the least possible nice. noise. Yeah. You want a fixed aperture 
and a fixed focus. So the aperture point of your lens, where it is the sharpest. Obviously you want a, um, a smaller aperture, a smaller gap to have no blurriness in your photos. But your smallest gap is not the sharpest point of the lens. Every lens is a little bit different. A general rule, it's usually in the middle, about 1 over 11, 1 over 12. Those are the normal points. Okay. You can either do a focus test yourself by taking a wedge of photos of one particular uh, object with lots of detail and looking at them closely to find your best point. Or you can look on the internet. There's a lot of uh, websites that give you a chart for every single lens and then they chart where is the sharpest point. Right. I personally did both on mine and I found uh, f over 11 to be the, uh, the best aperture point for sharpness. Great. So once I found that, I lock that. And then you also want to lock your uh, exposure time. Now exposure time is the one thing that can change over the whole shoot, but you want to keep it a consistent change. You want to change incrementally. Because sometimes you're shooting a light source, sometimes you're shooting a dark spot. You'll adjust your exposure time to get the, the most consistent exposure over the whole set of 500 photos. Wow. So and, and is that the, kind of the number that you're looking at is around 500 to start with? Is that that's the ideal spot to get to? or That's a reasonable number. Um, you need at least, you know, at least 200 to get a room that's like just a square room with some stuff. 200 will get you a full scan, 400 will get it much better. You will get less uh, bubbling, less uh, bad data in your scan. Okay, interesting. So when you're, when you're taking the photographs, what's your strategy for moving through the environment or moving through the room? How do you approach that? This one is key in that uh, the software wants a consistent uh, horizontal motion. So if it's a four walls and I'm trying to scan wall number one, I want to be perpendicular to that wall and I'm going to move the camera one inch every shot so that it's getting it at a 90 degree angle. Okay. I'm going to stand as far away from that wall as possible and get the far wall and then I'm going to walk around the edge of the room always pointing to the other far wall. Interesting. There is a, dist there is a distance limit here. If, you know, an average, a good limit is about three meters away. If the far wall is much farther away from that, if you're in a, like a big warehouse, then you're going to want to get the full distant wall, then you're going to want to get closer to it because less than, uh, you know, more than three meters is you not going to give you tell. Right, right. The other key thing is it doesn't do you any good to turn the camera especially around uh, the normal point of the lens. That doesn't help the software at all to figure it out. So turning like this does no good at all. You want to do a, a move with a turn, a move with a turn, that kind of stuff. Okay, cool, cool. So the corners are always a little difficult. One other thing is that I mount the camera to be in portrait mode, so it's more tall. And I do that so I can get a lot of the floor and the roof in my shot, and then my side to side I have full control of because I'm moving the thing. Okay, yeah, that makes that makes great sense. So the next question I have is, so you know, you scan your room. What about making a light probe? What do you, what's your strategy for doing a light probe? That one's kind of standard. You just need a uh, a nodal ninja or any other nodal head. Okay. I use a different camera for the light probe. I use a Nikon. So for that one, actually for both shoots, I always got to use a color chart. Okay. So the color chart helps me get the two cameras to be closer, get a white balance for each one. For that one, for the panos, I use just a, uh, an older Nikon with a fisheye lens. And then the important part is the pro mode for remote control. This allows you to do a bracket of nine photos at different exposures. And uh, I do 10 photos around, usually nine exposures each, depending on if it's indoor or outdoor, how much light there is. The key when you're shooting panos is you want to uh, focus on that light source and you want your darkest shot to be all black with a tiny bit of light source. Okay. If you're doing the sun, if you're doing outside in the sun, you want 
a black photo with a tiny dot as your sun for so the lowest exposure. How do you, you get that? Are you are you after that? Are you putting like an ND lens on the camera or something? How do you how do you clamp it down? Yeah. Yes, I do have a then ND lens on there. Okay. That's especially important for the sun. And I have for this one, I did a polarizer lens to help uh, get rid of reflections. Reflections. Or okay. Lower the reflections and specularity on anything that might be shining. So you're 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 putting filters on your lenses, is sort yeah, of part yeah. of the strategy then. Yeah, and you know, unfortunately, that darkens the shot a little bit. But with your tripod and a little bit of exposure time, it doesn't matter. You can still capture uh, decent light. Nice, nice, cool. So any other tips or tricks that you think are like, you're, you know, you're going to go out, you're going to try to attempt to do in your first photogrammetry or your first pano. What, what, what are the things that, that got you the first time? Well, you do have to uh, start small. You know, your first one, it's good to be in a controlled environment. You know, if you do it at home where things are not going to change quickly, that's, it helps. A controlled environment in a studio or an office. Once you go outside and you start doing things like, oh, I found a, a deserted skate pool, or I found uh, an old hotel with graffiti, or an alley with graffiti, once you're in public, it gets a little riskier because people get involved, cars get involved, you have some equipment and people can um, grab your stuff. I've had, I've had people interfere with my shoots many times. So, you know, controlled environment is the first thing to do. After that, take notes before you start because there are a lot of details and have a small checklist that says, I cleaned my lens. I'm using these settings. I'm for sure in RAW. Like sometimes you could shoot it in a JPEG format and uh, you just had a bad shoot because all of your photos will have less color range. They'll have a little bit additional noise because of the compression. You just have to check all your camera settings very carefully before you start. Right. Good tips. Sound advice. There's a list, you know. There's always a. Every software company has a list of these these tips and tricks, and they're all similar, but they're all a little bit different. You know, I've compiled one myself, and uh, you just have to go down that list. You got to remember to do it in a consistent way every time. Right. And after you've gotten your photos, do you then bring them into Lightroom and, and balance them, color balance them all to each other? Like, is there, is there a, you know, what's, what's the first step of the processing? Do you go right into the photo, photogrammetry software, like reality capture, or what do you- I what use do you... this color checker, this Macbeth color chart from x -Rite. Okay. So once I take a photo of this thing, this goes through a little piece of software from x -Rite and it pops out a, uh, a camera profile, a color profile. Then I go all my photos into Lightroom and I only do uh, two things. I do white balance and I give it the correct color profile. You can do a tiny bit of uh, exposure adjustment, but you shouldn't really. You can't do sharpening. You, you don't need to do lens distortion reversal. You shouldn't do anything uh, to modify the image. Just a little bit of color and white balance. Okay. Ideally, they're in raw, and then you write them out as TIFF, or another good format, pings, and you bring them into uh, reality capture. Okay, awesome. And then process away, and, and you end up with some data that's, that's gonna be usable or not usable. Where, where does the data well, dump you? This is the interesting thing. The process does take a long time. Say you had got 500 photos, they're uh, 6,000 by 4,000, they're pretty large. You know, that can take uh, 20 hours of processing. And once you get it out, you get this, uh, you get 50 million polygons. Then you get a texture. You can make like one 8K texture, you can make 10 8K textures, you can do almost anything with the textures. And it depends on how much process time you put into it. Then that model will have a great texture that are very, they're very together. I mean, it can look photorealistic if you have really flat lighting and nothing happening. So you bring that model into Maya and you just look at it. It can look, it can render out to look like a bunch of photographs. But if you look at it in uh, hardware render, you can see it, it'll have bumpiness, it'll have some, some messiness on it. So on the bad parts, you do have to do some polygon rebuilding. 
And that one's, you know, that's quite a bit of process, quite a bit of work. But you can rebuild in polygons and then reproject the same textures on there to get cleaner results, right. the roughest parts of your model. Which is exactly what we're going to be doing for our, for our piece. So we've got the raw data. I shared that to, uh, to our viewers last week. Um, and obviously now it's sort of the cleanup process begins from here. And that's where we'll end up kind of refining this over, over the journey to VR and getting to that really tight asset that's going to look great in the game engine and, and in renders too, actually. So that's, that's the end goal for us. Well, that's really cool, John. Thanks so much for taking the time to go through these, um, these tips and tricks. We'll actually be doing a written companion piece to this. So for those of you um, who kind of rattled off you know, a bunch of different ideas there, you can always go back and go to the Journey to VR blog and look at the written companion piece that we put together with this that, that will kind of highlight and pull out a few of those best practices. So thanks so much for taking the time to watch this. And thank you so much, John, for a, today's interview and, and more importantly, making a really cool asset for me. We really appreciate it. And it's, uh, it looks awesome. Well, thank you, Daryl. It's a pleasure. Cheers, man. Bye-bye.